I went from not wanting to be the king to being the kingmaker. I think for the first five years, next six, seven years, I wanted to be a, I wanted to be the king. Just fed the ego. It's what you do when you're young. You've got to make it about you. But then I got to that point where it was it was all about me, and I was like, this isn't doing it for me. I'm the king maker. Well, if I want to build kings and queens, I want them to be all different. So I started thinking like, I want to be in the African community. Think like a business owner. Distribution, Amazon, different markets, different languages. So I want to be in Spanish, Swahili, right? French, Japanese, all the different languages. All those different people, they all have different beliefs. And instead of me trying to figure out how to cater to each one, I just said, let's just make this all encompassing. And that really, that really came back down to my, my business vision. It all tied in. This meeting's for you guys. This next hour is for you guys. And I just want to let you guys know like how much I believe in all of you, right? I've been at this game 18 years and man, I just, I love, I love this game. And I love, like, I love watching people transform their business and life and, you know, this is a business where you go from like plateau to plateau, right? Um, valley to valley. <laughs> it's not always peak to peak. It's a lot of valley to valley. And I thought, you know what, let's get, you know, let's get five of the next, in my opinion, MVPs. And that's really what it came down to. I, I think that you five are, have the potential to be like the next five MVPs of the hierarchy in your respective categories, obviously by next year you'll be at, you'd be at the next level, but I know how hard you all work. I've asked your leadership about you guys extensively and it's just confirmed what I already knew. And uh, yeah, I just wanna let you know that I'm, I'm, I'm a proud to be in business with you guys and I really appreciate you guys. So thanks for being here today. Awesome, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I just really want this to be the next 50 minutes just learning, note-taking, just from experience and maybe some things you guys are, are battling through. And um, because if you're going through it, somebody else is going through it. And if you're going through it, likely I've been through it, yep. right? Or, you know, if it's like having a baby, I've never had delivered a baby, um, but I know somebody that has. <laughs> so I can direct you in the right, direct, like, I don't know if there's any of those questions going on today, but. I think we're <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go talk to Fox about that. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. So um, yeah. Why don't we just start quick? Why doesn't everyone just tell me just quick? You know, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds, kind of what they're excited about in their business. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really easy to get focused on what's not working. Mm -hmm. So I like to kind of just open the session, just quick. Just what are you? What are you excited about in your business in particular? Why don't we start with you, Kenny? Yeah, I mean, the thing that I'm most excited about is, is the consistency that I've been putting in since transitioning to be full-time with, with Jess. Um, and the fact that we're having a baby now in, in March, it's going to be really exciting to see, you know, how our team is shifting from where it was mm -hmm. to what it's going to become. Um, because since Vegas, there's been a huge shift in our business in terms of uh, directness, communication, running the system, mm -hmm. and just being a student of the game. Mm -hmm. So having all those things kind of come together and into one melting pot, I guess you could say, I'm starting to see the the, the results yeah. of the, the 60 and the 90 days that we know it usually takes to start to see results in the business. Yeah. So that's, I'd, I'd say for me, this is the biggest thing that I'm excited about. That's cool. It sounds like you have like more clarity. A lot more. Yeah. Like, I, like you're at yeah. system. Yeah. Or you have a baby coming. <laughs> a little more huge. clear now, yeah. right? And yeah. I find that there's a lot of people that, you know, they have kids or whatever, and that becomes the the excuse a lot mm -hmm. of times. Uh, where Jess and I, we've, we've gotten on the same page a lot where now that's our reason to get made, to make sure that we're building this the right way. Mm -hmm. We have our, you know, our six-month goal, uh, where we want to be by June, 100K, SMD's walking stage in Vegas. So we already know kind of the game plan and now it's just putting it to work. That's you know, when I had when I had, when I was pregnant with my first kid, I had people be like, Oh, watch out, now you got your first child, like you're gonna slow down. Yeah. And then I sped up. Yeah. And then I was like, Oh, you're having two, okay, like congrats. Just, you know, be careful. Like now it's sped up. And then it was like, Oh, you're having three. Like you're going from man to man coverage to zone defense now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I think that, yeah, I think it's, it's how you set it up. Right. It's how you set your relationship up with Jess. It's how you set your business up. Um, 
as long as you guys are on the same page, you guys are roll. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's Joe, how about you? What are you excited about? So many things. Yeah. Yeah, so many things. Uh, I'm excited about, um, you know, I've been a mom and stepmom for the last 20 some years, right? Yeah. And so I was sort of the foundation of everything yeah. in the background, making sure things were moving forward so Dale could be successful with his business. Yeah. And now it's completely rule reversed. Mm. And so I've had the opportunity to step into the light yeah. and be on stage. Yeah. And literally that's what I'm aiming for is to be on every stage that is offered yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, the thing that clicked for me recently is that the skill set that I already had from being a competitive athlete is directly related to this business. Huh. And it just clicked to just be clicked. a while. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. scary. And Chad had said to me, all you need to do is remember that and trust yourself. So Oof. right now, I, yeah, I have goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> um, my vision is very clear right now. And I'm driven by that daily. I'm surrounded by amazing people that we get to, you know, cheer each other on. Uh, I've seen a huge difference in Kenny. And uh, it inspires me to, to be better and do better. And so I love coming into the office. I love, you know, making myself proud, my family proud, my leadership proud. And yeah, it's, it's nothing holding me back for next Vegas. Wow, that's mm -hmm. huge. Wow, great job. Great job. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's probably been a while since you've competed too. Like, so was it a while ago you're an athlete? Yeah, it's mainly Steve, probably in my you know twenties. Right, that that's where I started. So you had it, that. you suppressed yeah. it, pushed yeah. it all the way down. Yeah, and you just had to kind of bring it up to the surface. You got it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you said be on stage. I think the key, like everybody's motivated for different reasons, mm -hmm. whether it's being on stage or like something, right? And I think that the big mistake people make is they try and they try and lean into something that excites them because it excites somebody else. Mm -hmm. But I always lean into what fires me up. Yeah. And I don't really care what fires anybody else up. I care what fires me up. You know, people are like, well, you know, don't talk about the income. Well, the income, if the income fires you up, then talk about the income. Mm -hmm. Just tie it into helping people. Yeah. Being on stage fires you up, then talk about being on stage. If competing fires you up, then go compete. Yeah. Um, Oh, I like that. That's awesome. Ritza. <laughs> well, I'm really excited about purpose, mm. possibilities, promise, and just representing a people. Mm. You won't believe it, but today marks the second anniversary of me living in this country, landing in the Canada. Just two years. Yeah. Two years. Oh, today awesome. is my second year. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm so fired up with purpose. Mm. I have a village to save. Mm. And in this big space of Canada, of the Caribbean people is just, just a village. I have a village to represent, a village to lead, a village to save, mm. Steve. And the possibility that I get from WFG tells me that you can be a newcomer mm. and you can make that happen. You don't have to question the longevity period to have an impact. Mm -hmm. The promise of the company says mm -hmm. that after time, just follow the system mm -hmm. and the promises are there. Mm -hmm. What do you want for yourself? What do you want for your people? The system makes it happen mm -hmm. once you stay true to, true to the system. So that really fires me up because I can see that it is possible to happen. I can see that I can make that purpose real. Mm -hmm. I can deliver on the promise. And I know that the potential is there for all others that come from my village, meaning the Caribbean, or from a wider diaspora, that's fine, wherever you came from, that the, the stage is set. And the company is really geared towards mm -hmm. each other. And everybody can, this stage that we talk about mm -hmm. all the time, we can be on that stage. Imagine you and your village mm -hmm. on that stage. That's, that's wow. fire. <laughs> Congrats, that's a, that's a big deal. Yeah. Different level of gratitude, Yes. right? Like, I born I was born and raised just down the street, right like up the northwest. And uh, you you've been you know you've only been here two years. That's crazy. Oh, that's awesome, Shandine. What are you excited about? She inspired me, and the reason why she does is because she's very new to this country, and she's kicking asses. Yeah. And for me, that's no excuses mm. for anybody else who's been here for a long time and decided that this business can't be what they want it to be. And from a very young age, I, was, I knew that I was an entrepreneur. Um, I remember when I was very young, I used to sell little Kit Kats and stuff back mm -hmm. in school. And I know that, you know, 
this is what attracts me. I just need to be successful in whatever I touch. Mm. And I'm addicted to success. Mm. Mm. And so for me, failure is not an option. Mm. It's not a part of my game. Mm. And I'm not playing it. <laughs> so I ran a business before that was very successful. Mm. And I had to let it go. And this opportunity came right to me. Mm. And I don't take it lightly. I think it's God's plan. Mm. And the moment I know that there's no glass ceiling in this business, I know that this is where mm. I'm supposed to be. And so my dedication to this business is full on. Mm. I don't make excuses, regardless of whatever it is. I have three children, a husband who's a child as well, a <laughs> mother-in-law, a dog, a bird, and three fishes. And not even my children are going to hold me back from making this business a success for me. And if I have to bring them here every night, and if I have to bring them here every day, and that's what it takes, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to the next level of this business. That's so inspiring. And your kids are so well behaved too. Thank you. Yeah, I love having kids around. That's amazing. Thank you. Nick, how about you? Yeah, I think for the most part, um, being still relatively you know new and kind of getting my foot in the door, I think the biggest notice that I've started to realize, and even that my partner Kieran, is just that shift in the mindset. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, it started to become, <clears throat> you know, uh, maybe once a week for 10 minutes, I think, what could I do to push my business forward? Mm -hmm. And to watch it transition into that being the first thing that I think about when I wake up mm -hmm. to one of the last things I think about before I go to bed. And that, you know, 12 hour shift or that, that 15 hour shift of, you know, what I do day to day to how I can fit this into my schedule as much as I can mm -hmm. has just been a huge impact on, you know, the law of attraction. And the more we think about it, I think the more you're going to receive as well. Yeah. I think that's just so been cool. so cool and so crucial to, you know, the people that really want it, you're, you're going to get, you know, what you, you practice and what you preach. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, there's different science of the universe will reward you in that way. And yeah, I think that's the biggest thing that I'm that's most huge. excited about because it just really shows that my mind's in the right place mm -hmm. in order for me to get me to that path that I'm looking to, to, uh, to achieve. So that's, that's so good. You know, that reminds me of something, <clears throat> you know, I think in the beginning when, when we joined this business, if we're not a hundred percent before there's that moment where before we're hundred percent sold out, like we're excited. It's kind of cool. We're hanging around, we're coachable, but I think a lot where a lot of people go wrong is they, they expect this to be like the perfect, a perfect business. And then they doubt like, Oh, is this my path? This is what I can do. Like the, the, the perfect business is the one you sell out to hundred percent. Like, Maybe this is just me like oversimplifying it, but I thought to myself, if there's, if there's great product and there's a great environment and there's great people and there's like evidence that some other people have won here, if I go all in, I'm going to win too. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have that little toe syndrome. They're like, they're like little toe in, little toe, little toe, little toe. Oh, I, I, I don't, I love this part, but I don't love that part. Mm -hmm. I like this, but I don't like that. And they spend their whole life searching, 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 and they never really find it. Where me, I spend most of my time when I'm thinking, selling myself the dream on why this is the best business. I, every day I, I reconvince myself why this is the best. I resell myself the dream because there's some days that I don't feel great. There's some days that are harder than others. But you know, sometimes my best, my best guy quits or an SMD calls me, Nick, and is like, man, like I'm going through some marital issues right? Or, or uh, an associate calls you and there's some really crazy stuff going on in their life. And you're like, man, like you just, you just, you just, not every day just feeds you, just feeds you. But man, every day you're responsible to sell yourself the dream on why this is the best opportunity. And that, that's one thing that I think I've just gotten really, really good at. You're like, man, you can sell the dream because every day I sell the dream to myself because I'm the one who, who you, you, everyone comes into my office one day everyone's going to come into your office and if you aren't 100% sold out on this thing if you don't if you're not 100% like you don't have to say that there, there's no bad days but if you're not 100% sold out to this thing and like constantly reminding yourself why it's the best business then you're going to get lost in the shuffle right i never thought i'd be in the insurance industry but i i do all my research on why this is the best industry right now, it's funny because now everybody on TikTok and Instagram Reels is getting into the insurance business. I've been in the insurance business for 18 years. <clears throat> so the social media, the social media uh, draw is now really helping our business. People are calling me up. Hey, do you have permanent insurance policies? I saw a video on TikTok. I'm like, okay, first of all, don't take your advice from TikTok. 
but I've been, I've been selling myself the dream for years on the wealth wave, right? I, did, I, I read an article the other day because I'm researching all the time. 90% of North Americans are underinsured. I shared the article, right? Um, the stats on CI. Um, then you go to the business opportunity, the, the control of time, the income we can make, the residual component, the, the, low, the low, uh, low overhead for licenses. You know, I'm constantly selling myself the dream so that when, you know, I read a bad article about our industry or our company or, you know, this, this happens, I have all this fuel in my tank. Does that make sense? Because yes. if not, you're just one negative thing away from taking two weeks off mentally. And every, every week you take off mentally, you have to, it takes two weeks to get back in the game. If you check out for like a month, it, it, sometimes it takes two months to get back on the horse, like fully, because you've lost all your momentum. So what used to be a, like a really down week became like a really down couple days, became a, 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 like a down day. And now it's like, a, it's like a 15 minutes of like, not even, it's like, usually it's like a couple thoughts or 10 minutes compartmentalize it and you're back on the horse, right? So um, why don't we start with some questions? Why don't we go around this way and um, you guys can ask, start with your, your top question, your favorite question, and then we can just feed off it. I'm not sure how many questions we'll get to, but Nick, why don't, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me, um, you know, coming from an industry where I, I do and am surrounded by people that have been in uh, the business that I'm currently in for, you know, 18 plus years, um, I think my biggest question was, you know, what drove you the most in your first year um, compared to your current year? And is there any similarities in those mindsets? And then what would you think would be some of the biggest differences? So what drove me in my first year versus what drives me now? Yeah. Ooh, that's a great question. <clears throat> I think that, I think the answer to that is 100% tied to my personal growth and development. And this goes back to my original comment. It's, you should be excited at, about whatever you're excited about. So in my first year at 23, Nick, I wanted to tattoo a bunch of my friends on the forehead with my 100K ring. That motivated me. The haters, the doubters, um, the competing, the money. I wanted to make yeah. money. I wanted to make 100,000. I wanted to get my ring. I wanted to compete. I wanted to, like, I wanted to be the go-to. I wanted to prove the doubters wrong. So it was a lot of like, um, it, was a lot of, a lot of, it was a lot about me. And, and, I, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think in the beginning, like airplane, oxygen, like low oxygen level, put your mask on first. I think if you can't fight for yourself, um, then it's gonna be hard to fight for other people because oh, people say, I'm here for my spouse. What happens if you and your spouse are fighting? I'm here for my kids. What happens if it's the day where you wanna sell one of your kids? <laughs> then what? You got to do it for you. So in the beginning, Nick, it was it was it was a lot of like. I had, it was a lot to prove. I had a lot to prove, and I think everyone in this in this room should should should, should lean into that. Everyone in this room has something to prove. You got to prove yourself here. You got to make the team. You guys are in training camp. You guys showed up, but there's a hundred other athletes in the camp. What's gonna What's gonna put you on the team? You got to prove yourself. How do you prove yourself? Fight, qualify for a contest, get your promotion, win the board, win the biggest paycheck, have the most guests, just prove yourself, right? Because what it does is, is, is it starts to build your confidence. So, I, so you know, uh, 50, my first 50K watch, I got my 50K watch. I proved to myself that I could do it. Like, then I got my ring. I proved to myself I could make six figures. And then over time, that became empty. It became hollow and I started to grow as a human. And now what drives me is legacy. Whew, my whole body just got numb. What do I wanna be known for? What do I wanna be known for? Well, you guys get to decide right now what you wanna be known for. Well, I wanna be known for as a guy that was um, direct, was honest, but empathetic. I wanna be known for a guy that has your back, would take a bullet for you, but would also call you out in, the, in a private setting and challenge you to step up because he believed in me. Um, you know, I wanna be known as the guy that wasn't at every single family dinner, right? Not that I ever wanted to be at every single family dinner, 
but I want it to be known as the guy that when, when dad shows up, oh my God, dad's here, right? I told the story at Jared's event. It's like, I'm not at every single practice, dry land training, bottle drive, food drive. I need a, that's a full-time job. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm, I'm running a business that my wife and I are a partner. Now, single parents, they have a little different challenge there, but um, I wanna be known as the dad that he comes to all the important stuff. And when dad's there, kids are watching, right? So what drives me now is my legacy. It's, it's how do I wanna be remembered? You know, the older I get, Nick, the, the more I have people in my age group pass away. So with my Crohn's now, you know, being my 40s, whatnot, I, maybe it's a healthy, I start to think about the end. Is it, is, it, is it 70? Is it 85? Is it 90? God forbid something happened to me tomorrow. How do I want my teen to remember me? What was the last interaction I had with my, with my kids? What's the last interaction I had with Kenny, right, with Shandine? How did I make that person feel in the last meeting of the day on a Friday when I was tired in the morning, my new recruit quit? So I think a lot about legacy and how I want to be remembered and how I want my kids to remember me and my family to remember me. Um, and that drives me. Legacy is everything now, right? Um, you know, not everyone's going to like me, but, you know, I'd rather be respected than liked by everybody. So it was about me. <clears throat> I, I conquered that part of me. And now, you know, people that doubt me, I, you know, I just, I pray for them. Uh, you know, people that hate and doubt and, you know, and say bad things. I mean, there's obviously something that happened to them in their life where they, they have to feel like they need to speak like that. So I hope that they find their peace. Their issue with me has nothing to do with me, it has everything to do with themselves and their confidence. And I just pray that one day they find their confidence like I found mine. So that's what's changed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Shan, you had a question? Um, just to tip off of the one you just did, we all have challenges, we, we all agree. Um, what are some mental strategies that you implement to move forward and stay focused on your vision? Ooh, that's so good. <clears throat> you know, you have three kids, right? Yeah. It's like one kid, one problem. Two kids, two problems. Mm -hmm. Three kids, three problems. Husband, four. four. Yeah. Dog, five. <laughs> so <clears throat> as life gets bigger, we have more challenges. You guys know who Dean Graziosi is? Yeah. yeah? Um, he's a really big influencer, mindset coach. I was having lunch with him at the Arte event with Ed and Andy, and we're sitting around a lunch table, and, we're, and uh, he kind of leans over to me. He says, you know what your problem is, Steve? He says, you need bigger problems. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you need bigger problems. You, sh you should pray for bigger problems. He says, you shouldn't ask for it to be easier, you, should, you, shouldn't, you should pray that you can increase your capacity. It's all about increasing your capacity. So when, when, when we're, you're an associate in business, you can handle associate problems. Mm -hmm. This is an associate problem. Um, you're learning to deal with like somebody quitting and, and not following through. I had three teammates and only one showed up. Those are associate, that's associate capacity, right? If all of a sudden you're an associate, and I saddled you with the, with, the, with the challenge of having an SMD quit on you, you'd have a heart attack. You'd be in your bathtub, like sucking your thumb, like <laughs> cradling yourself to sleep. You'd have to put a warm blanket on you. But then you become a marketing director and your capacity increases and you can deal with different sets of problems. You think about like the, the image that, that pol politics aside, do you guys remember the, the, the image of when George Bush was reading the book to the kids in the kindergarten class, and he found out the trade towers were bom was bombed. It's a famous clip. So he's in, a, he's in a kindergarten class reading a book, and a Secret Service guy walks over and goes, sir, we don't know what he said, but now we do. Sir, trade tower was hit by a plane, and he's like this. Keeps reading, and then 10 minutes later, guys come back and go, sir, the second tower has been hit and they're both down. And uh, he just kind of finishes up, he walks away, and, he, and, he, and you think about people at that level, they have grandkids, they have illnesses, and they're dealing with like, like, like big things. So the, what happens is that you, the, the challenge is, you guys, is you have to start to increase your capacity to deal with problems. And one big way I do it is I compartmentalize my emotions. So what I do is, I schedule time to deal with my issues. So for example, 
Um, you know, and again, it's easier said than done. But I can't, what I used to do, Shan, is I used to be like, I, if I had three, four stressful things going on, I used to worry about them all at the same time for the entire day. Mm -hmm. And I would be mentally exhausted. So what I do is I'm aware of them and I and, and I'll deal with them in the moment, but I'll unless it's like imminent and I have to deal with it right this second, what I'll do is I'll schedule a couple hours at the end of the day, I'll move a couple meetings and I'll like from six to eight, I'm in that issue. I'm dealing with it. I'm calling the lawyers, I'm calling my wife or I'm calling the school, I'm dealing with that. Um, you really have to be able to put your put your issues in a bucket and temporarily suspend them or else you'll operate like everybody else. Here's how the middle class mindset operates. They'll win as long as nothing is going wrong in their life. Like when nothing's going wrong, they're winning. They win all the contests, they're showing up, they're making money, but then it's but then there's the the people that it's like, well, my husband's sick. Okay, well that's terrible. And then it's like my kid has some stuff going on at school. Okay, good. What else? Well, there's stuff in my job. Okay, and then you start to realize it's always something. You have to, you have to win anyway. Mm -hmm. The answer is you gotta win anyway. Like, shit's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You have to win anyway. So, in, unless, it's, unless it's like, like major, mm -hmm. like my kid is diagnosed and he's in the hospital getting chemo, that's a major, major thing. We're not talking about, but other than that, it's like, it's like I, this to me was the goose that was gonna lay the golden eggs. And people don't protect the goose. The, the, my priority is obviously to my family and my business. If my business isn't running, I can't be effective in my family. This is my goose. So this is going on, this is going on, this is going on, this is going on. Steve, do you hear about that? This is happening. Steve, your client wants to, wants to withdraw. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Let's, uh, let's meet at four to, uh, to discuss it. I got, a, I got a meeting I have to hop into. And then he, boom, you're in a recruiting interview, you're selling the dream, how great this business is. So to me, it's a couple things there to unpack. It's, it's learning to increase your capacity to deal with bigger problems. Mm -hmm. Like I've had SMDs that have quit. I've had three or four SMDs that quit. Some people can barely see themselves getting to SMD. And I was at a Hawaii event one year with Swan Nguyen, who's you know, a $15 million a year earner. And uh, he's, a, he's a Vietnamese guy and he was two-fisting, drinking back when it was a party, party company. And we're standing around the bar. And somebody said, Steve, you know you're not in business until you've had an SMD quit. And I was like, <gasps> I was like, where's the paper bag? I'm like, <sighs> I, couldn't even, I, I couldn't even imagine. I'm like, what, people quit at SMD? And then Swan turns around and he goes, he, he, he. <laughs> you're not in business until you have a CEO quit. And I was like, what? Exactly. <laughs> it shouldn't make sense for where you're at, for where you're at. But his capacity is so big to deal with issues. See, when you start, your first licensed agent quits and you're contemplating the meaning of your life. And then you get to where I'm at and a licensed agent quits and you'd be like, hey, I just, I wish you the best. Yeah, the door is always open. Hope you're doing great. Yeah, everything okay? Okay, we'll see you later. And you don't think about it ever again, ever again. That's personal growth, personal development, right? Leaning on mentors. When you guys are around mentors and you're asking them questions, I don't just want you to, I, don't, I just don't want you to see how they answer. I want you to see how they are because leadership is caught, it's not taught. Mm -hmm. So whenever something happens that you need to report to your coach or your mentor, I'll just speak for myself. I just want you to see how I react to it. And I want you to learn to react the same way. If I'm getting kind of worked up about it, then maybe it's something you should get worked up about too. If, if I'm not really getting worked up about it, it's not gonna take the pain away, but it's teaching you how that you should respond. Because if I'm not super concerned about it, then you, should probably, you shouldn't be either. If I don't think it's the end of the world that, you're, that, you're, that your new agent just quit, you shouldn't either. Because to be honest, Shan, he was gonna quit anyway. You just saved yourself six months. Yeah. Okay, all right, I'm gonna be okay. I'm yeah. not gonna die. All right, what else is going on? Because you gotta save your tank. You gotta save yourself for the stuff that's really going on that matters. So I see people, they blend, they have a bad, there's all this stuff's going on and they, they, they just, it just ruins their day. They're just always thinking about it. It's always going on. But if my wife and I are, are dealing with something, um, like, listen, hon, let's just, let's meet tomorrow night for two hours. Let's sort it out, okay? But kids need us, we need us, business needs us. 
I love you. I'll see you tonight. Okay, we're good. Rather than <laughs> going into a meeting. <sighs> I didn't see that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Set it aside, compartmentalize, get on the same page, deal with it, but just be in the moment. So I don't know if that answers your question. But Maritza? That, that blew my mind how you put this in that. Yeah. That's a, such a huge takeaway. Just compartmentalize your emotions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my questions to, for you was uh, with regard to the way that the general public is today. Mm -hmm. Like, it seems like there's a sense of urgency with people. I don't know if you feel that. And our company's mission is no family left behind. Um, do you feel a sense of urgency in driving our mission and like, how have you shifted with the urgency of today with, with uh, making sure that you execute the mission or represent no family left behind? Mm -hmm. What do you yeah. mean by there's a sense of urgency out there? What do you mean by that? Well, it seems as if uh, life is no longer like a cup of tea. People are, people are desperate. People feel like they're not getting where they need to. Like, let's say I'm, not, I'm nowhere close to retirement that I want to be. Or it just seems like it's not as stable as it used to be. And so people are a little more unsettled. And uh, we know that we represent the people and mm -hmm. really bring solutions to them that they didn't think was available to them in the first place. So how have you shifted to up that game with uh, relieving that sense of urgency that folks have? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I think that, yeah, I agree. I think people are more unsettled and there's a lot more stress and anxiety out there. But which is good, which is, which is, which is, I don't say, I don't like to use the word good, but it's, um, it, it's, it's a positive for our industry, specifically our company and our team, because we, we solve the crisis two ways. We solve it with proper financial education that everybody deserves. And then we solve it by, for the right person, we teach them how to get a license and increase their cash flow. So we solve the education crisis and we solve the cash flow crisis. So like, again, that's why we're the greatest business in North America today, because we can solve it two ways. But I will say that with all that stuff going on, people are also be more beaten up. They've been, they feel like they've been let down. They feel like they've been lied to. They feel like they've been, some of them have been cheated on. They've been disposed. There's no loyalty anymore at the workplace. They've been, they've been thrown aside. Some people on their second, third marriage because of financial stress. Um, so I find that people are guarded too, and they're still skeptical. They want to find the thing, but they're, uh, they're skeptical of that thing because they were promised so many things in their life. They were promised faithfulness. They were promised, you know, 30 year job and just to get an email saying that they've been laid off. So, and you have to forgive people for that. So you really have to know where they're coming from. You, mm -hmm. People have been just beaten down. So I don't blame people when they're skeptical. I don't get upset when people have some questions. I come from a place of understanding. How, is it, how has it changed my approach? It's just really, what it's really, it's really done, Ritza, it's really helped me expand my vision, right? My 5,000 license vision really came out of COVID. Um, from COVID, which was a dark spot in our society, depend, it doesn't matter what your, what your whole thing, belief is on that whole thing, that whole, that whole era, man, that really, that created a huge division between the people and the governments and the, and the system and, you know, create, it drew a line in the sand and families, like it just ripped, it just ripped our society apart, good or bad, it doesn't matter. It, it just, it created that. Um, and that's for me where I started to think big, bigger than ever. And I thought, man, you know what we need? We need a team of 5,000 licensed agents. <clears throat> you know what kind of team we need? <clears throat> we need an inclusive team. We need a team of all people. I want a team, I want to, so then it really what it, it, it changed for me is I had to reevaluate re kind of a leader I wanted to be. Because I'll be honest, like, like, you know, I was starting to vocalize my opinion a little bit and kind of, you know, not go down the rabbit hole in certain things, but, you know, Every tenth post, you could kind of get a feel for what side of the what side of the track I was on, whether it was vax, non-vax, or political, or this and that. And then I just sat back and I thought, "Wow, hold on, Holbrook, it's so messed up out there. You want to build a team of five thousand agents? What kind of people do you want on your team? Holy shit, I want all people. I want people that voted right and voted left. 
I wanted people that got vaxxed and aren't vaxxed. I want all people. I want to create a place where all, everybody can feel welcome. What, do, what, do, what does society need more than ever? They need an environment where everybody feels welcome, where everybody feels included, where everybody has a voice, right? And yeah, if you know me well enough and we're sitting around and it's midnight at, a, at, at Saturday night and you, you want to talk politics one-on-one, of course you're going to find out what, uh, how I feel. And I, I'm entitled to but it's not gonna be at the expense of drawing a line in the sand. So it, 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 it caused me to reevaluate my leadership style. When I see people, and I don't have anything wrong with people getting vocal on social and F this and F that, because it's freedom of speech. It's a beautiful country. You can do what you want. I don't resent people like that. But when you get on social media and you, and you divide your audience, what you're doing is you're, you're taking your vision from here and you're automatically cutting it to here because you're just eliminating all these other people. So it doesn't really matter my opinion uh, from the, I used to get calls all the time. When are, you gonna, when are you gonna make another post about Black Lives Matters? And when are you gonna make another post? People call me out. When are you gonna make a gender post? And when are you gonna make a, and I just say, listen, um, I'm a leader of all people, right? I have my beliefs and, and my message is clear. I'm, everybody deserves a shot. I had this shot with my mentor, Ed, like a month ago. And I say, hey, what's, have you noticed a lot of the influence on, online are, are really cashing in on this right-wing conservative channel? They're going down this path, right? Um, whether it's like Ben David or all these guys, they're, they're, really, they're really drawing a line in the sand and really, really leaning into their political views and going hard at it. Um, he goes, yeah, he goes, a lot of those guys are doing it um, over the next two, three years. It's the, he calls it the Trump effect. And they're doing it because they're gonna gain a lot of views and a lot of YouTube subscribers and this and that. And I said, well, Ed, how come, how come you're not doing that? Um, and he said, well, I'm not doing it because I wanna be a leader of all people. He says, every week I get a call from somebody, right side, left side, wanna come on my podcast. But I, I say, no, I, I can't have you on because I can't lean one way or the other. Right, I have my personal opinions, but he goes, I wanna be a leader of all people. He goes, I have my beliefs, I have my views, and they're personal to me, and he expresses them from time to time. He goes, I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna get as many YouTube hits. I'm not gonna get as many YouTube hits or viewers from it, but he goes, I'm clear. I'm clear on, on who I am. So that's just me too. Like, like you just, it, it, it just caused me to like, I really wanna get above it all. And because things are so dis divisive, I don't wanna be that guy. I want you to be able to feel comfortable coming to me. I also want you to know I have my own opinion. I'm not just a sheep, like I do have my own opinion, but I don't want it to affect our, our team. I want people to come to our Dream Summit conference and feel welcome. It's like, you know, here in Alberta, you know, we're like, oh, I can't, I can't wait to find out who voted NDP, everyone always says that. I'm like, well, 50% of people did, so there's, there's, they're everywhere. So it doesn't matter who voted for what. They have their own. They have their own reasons for doing it, and they're. And I'm glad that they voted. Like we can't be so harsh with with. with we can't be so uh, quick to judge people for their views. We want to be a team when 750 people show up. That it doesn't matter where they came from. It just matters what they want to do in business. So that's that's what this era has caused me to redefine. Yeah, yeah. Thank. Great question. Whew. That was a really good one, Joe. Yeah. Well. You know what? I'm I'm gonna roll with what information is coming out. Because yeah. You know, like yeah. You know, we're on it. We're in different levels. I think so. <laughs> so what really spoke to me in Vegas was the unity aspect. Mm. A lot of conversation about unity. Yeah. Uh, Chad's uh, talk in Edmonton. Unity. And what what's driven me a lot of my life is service and community. And so that's the kind of leader that I want to be. I just don't find necessarily that, that vision is completely clear for me about what that looks like and how vast it could be. And when I look at you, I'm inspired by that because I feel like that's what you mm -hmm. embody. <clears throat> could you tell me a little bit about how you've gotten to that place, how important mindset is, scheduling is, you know, how did you work on yourself to get yourself to that level where that's how people were seeing you and you embody it? Okay. Yeah. So do maybe just kind of clarify a bit what you mean by unity. What do you mean by that? I mean, all inclusive, just like you're talking about people. I don't, I don't want to separate, you know, because of their view, yeah. uh, because of their nationality, because of their mm. political beliefs or cultural beliefs or religion. You know, you just, you just outline that for me, which I think mm. is beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
that you want to be all inclusive yeah. as a leader. Okay. What does it take to get to that place? Um, I think it. What it takes is you really, you really got to sit down and go through the exercise of what do you want your team to be. Mm-hmm. Like when you when you close your eyes and you imagine stepping on stage at your event, maybe twenty twenty eight, twenty twenty nine, your event. You got five hundred people in the crowd. Like, who do you see? Before I really started to develop this, and it even this goes back to right even before COVID, my team was was predominantly white males. Because all I could see was myself. Yeah, and we women were welcome and, and you know, we had some powerful women over the years. But specifically the people that I gravitated more towards are people that were just like me. But then I but then I sat back and I came from a I came from like a, a mission standpoint. But also came from a business standpoint. I want I want people that that look different than me. I I I can't I can't connect to the same people that you can connect to. I can't connect to the people that Maritza can. I don't. You know what cha- changed for me, Joe? I didn't. I went from not wanting to be the king to being the kingmaker. I think for the first five years, next six seven years, I wanted to be a, I wanted to be the king. Just fed the ego. It's what you do when you're young. You've got to make it about you. But then I got to that point where it was, it was all about me. And I was like, this isn't doing it for me. I'm the king maker. Well, if I want to build kings and queens, I want them to be all different. So I started thinking like, I want to be in the African community. Think like a business owner. Distribution, Amazon, different markets, different languages. So I want to be in Spanish, Swahili, right? French, Japanese, all the different languages. So... Those, all those different people, they all have different beliefs. And instead of me trying to figure out how to cater to each one, I just said, let's just make this all encompassing. And that really, that really came back down to my, my business vision. It all tied in, right? So I think it comes back down to how you speak. So I started speaking like, hey, we're going to be a team of all people. I've been saying that for five or six years, all, all backgrounds, all walks of life, right? And they start pointing people out, be like, look at Murph. Murph is from Ghana, right? Look at Nabi, born in Afghanistan. Like you have all these, then you start using examples and you start, you start shining the light on, you start shining the light in the areas of your business that you want to, that you want to, you want more of. Um, but I think it really starts, it really comes back down to your vision, right? Like how are we going to get to 5,000 licensed agents? Not just by the, my Caucasian community in Calgary, my God, you know, we're, I'm a minority now in Calgary. There's so many immigrants in this city. It's amazing. So instead of me trying to figure out um, how to cater it all to everybody individually, um, what if we just focus on being like super high level, inclusive, make everybody feel welcome, right? And that way Shan can come here and find her tribe, right? And I think before, this is the last point here, but before you can find your vision and build that for you, you have to be a part of somebody else's. So you guys don't have to worry yet about seeing that for yourself. What I would do if I were you is I would like, I would like bunk in to this team and really lean into this team, really lean into the SCDT vision and start to like build your identity under the umbrella of our team. Because it really shows your team that you can be aligned and before you're a great leader, you're a great follower. So be a great follower and a great steward of the business and of the system and, and, and speak the same language as me. And then one day, you guys will have your own event and it's, it's game over. And then I'm coming to your event as a guest speaker, right? Everybody wants to skip that part, be the leader, be the, be the but we forget we gotta be the follower first, right? So within Chad's organization, within my organization, so you start saying things like, I would start saying things like, you know, we're going to be, we're going to have a hundred licenses as part of Steve's team, right? We're going to be one of the biggest EMD teams. We're going to, Holbrook's goal is to have 5,000 licenses in five years, right? I'm going to have 200 of those. And I'll just have 200 of those. I'm going to have, you know, 300 on the East Coast, 100 on the West Coast, 100 in the U.S. Not just in the U.S., but we're going to be in Mississippi, Texas, and Florida, right? So you just start really breaking it all down. And then I hear that vision from you, and then I can pull you up on stage and be like, man, this couple or this person has got a vision, got a goal, and then one day you're doing your own event. And it's not about our vision anymore, it's about your vision. Not a lot enough, not enough people like le- leverage the synergy of this team. There's a lot of synergy here. Everybody's, a lot of people try and do it their own way. It's like, 
Why are you trying to do it your own way? You don't need to. Let's just all fly together, and then one day you'll have your own flock, right? So, yeah. KZ? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it's been it's been great, and uh, you know, going last is always entertaining because you get to hear everybody else take yeah. question. But you know, I wanted to dive more in on the business aspect of things because you know we've totally talked about the mindset yeah. and what it's going to take. But in a business, when you're running a system, systems can can break. Yeah. You don't need to throw out the entire system, but you know, coming from somebody that's built a business over you know the time period that you have. How often are you taking inventory on the things that do need to be addressed? Like, what are you doing on a daily or weekly basis? Because there's always going to be blind spots. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing, you know, more or less personally or within your, your, your leadership crew? How often are you guys taking inventory of, of things that need to be addressed? And how are you actually getting to that point of noticing them? Mm -hmm. Now, can you say need to be addressed? Like what specifically? Well, just in a, in a general sense, right? You know, you're... When you're talking about the system aspect of things, you know, maybe maybe recruiting is down or maybe mm -hmm. production is down or, or maybe something in the office mm -hmm. isn't working the way that it normally does. Yeah. You know, you obviously need to be taking inventory on everything as a, you know, as, as the person that is in the front leading as by the example. Yeah. How often are you going through yeah. and, and taking taking note of the problems that inevitably do come up? Yeah, that's a good question. I think like at the end of every month before, right before I set my new goals for the month. So usually around like the 30th or 31st, I'll get, I'm preparing for the next month. Um, I'm really looking at the month as a whole. So I'm looking at my goals. I'm looking at my personal recruiting, personal production. I'm looking at all my holes. So the first question I ask myself is like, how tight are we on the system? So how tight are we on the system? So for example, okay, we recruited Sarah. When did we recruit Sarah? We recruited her on the third, okay. So did she get the seven day standard? Did we go in her top three? Did we get her plan done? So I'm identifying holes. So like I'm, I'm looking back going, you know what? We, we missed a bunch of plans or we missed a bunch of, of, of seven day standards. And then I'm looking at volume. Did we even have enough volume to hit the goal? Like we said we wanted to do five and 20, but what was our volume? Yeah, we did. So to do five and 20, we need to be doing 40 appointments a month, which is 10 a week. So how many did we do? And if we did six a week instead of 10, then I'm going, okay, we were down. We need to increase that by four a week. Okay, we have a hole here on the seven day standard and we have a hole here on the personal plans. So then what I'll do is I'll gear all of my leadership meetings and training and CFT calls and one-on-one -on -one conversations for the next month toward to patching those holes. I always try and patch like one or two holes a month, not everything. I'm just trying to patch one or two holes. Um, you like, if you had a month guys where it's like zero recruit, zero point, zero cash flow, I might have a, I might just, my month goal might just be to write 20,000 points. Yeah, I still want to get a couple directs, but like maybe two directs and 20,000 points. So every once in a while, you have to overcompensate for an area that you have a hole in. Mm -hmm. So at the end of every month, <clears throat> I'm looking at the month as a whole, what did I commit to? What did we do? Where did I miss? Again, having a high level of self-awareness is mandatory to win big. A lot of people are afraid to look at their numbers. They're afraid. Some people say, oh, I don't even log into my WFG. I don't, want, I don't want to see it. I'm a freak on it, even in a bad month, right? I'm in there. I'm on the leader's bulletin. Hey, if you're, if you're 700th on the, or it doesn't go that low. If you're 400th on the leader's bulletin, you should highlight 400 on the leader's bulletin. And then next month, if you're 315, you're up. If you're 405, you're down. Everybody wants to look at the numbers when they're feeling great. You have to separate your emotion from the numbers. There is no room for emotions in running a business system. The system is the system. I did 20 meetings. I didn't gather info on any of them. There's a hole there. You should gather info on 62.5% of the time. So every, every, every 10 meetings you do, you should gather info six times. Every 20 appointments, you should gather 13, 13 times. If you do 20 meetings, you need to gather info eight times. Let's look at the times you didn't. Oh, husband with no wife. 18 year lives at home in his mom's basement. Okay, so out of the 20 we did, really I put myself in position of 15 of them to win. Out of 15, I gathered 10. My info gatherers are tight. I don't have an info gatherer hole. I have a quality of market hole. Or I went on 20 qualified appointments. I gathered info four times you have an info gather problem. 
you're soft on the info gather, you lack confidence, you're weak. Or I gathered info 15 out of 20, I didn't close anything. That's because you, you gather info the wrong way. You're not pre-closing, you're not setting up the carry back, and, you, and, and your carry back is off. There's the hole. So those are the exercises I'm going through at the end of every month. So like, like, like think of it like month to month, I'm evaluating where we're at, and then week to week, we're running plays. Running plays, running plays, running plays, running plays. Like, hey, emergency phone zone. Like, we're trying to win the week. Every week, we're trying to win the week. Every week's a new week. We're trying to win the week. And then at the end of every month, we're reevaluating. And we recruited 10 people, and only four have their plans done. So how come six did become clients? Mm-hmm. Well, because we didn't do the FALP interview properly. Okay. So we have a FALP interview hole. And then, I mean, again, it's, it, it, it's never perfect. Right. You're just trying to stay on it. Yeah. If you, can, if you can be better on it than you've ever been, you're gonna win bigger. Most people in WFG run no system. Right. So that's what I'm doing at the end of the month. Reevaluating. Yeah.